I'm Shanine. Welcome to the Chit Chat Podcast, where we explore life through soulful conversation. I'm joined today by a lovely friend, Charlie Bourne, and we're going to be exploring her experiences of mental health and working with RHS Bridgewater in sustainable horticulture. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Chit Chat podcast where I'm very excited to be interviewing a good friend of mine, Charlie Bourne, and I'm hoping to explore with her the work she does in sustainable horticulture at RHS Bridgewater and also about our shared passion and understanding of exploring the mind and spirituality and the three principles understanding as well. So I'm really looking forward to having a conversation with Charlie today. Um, So thank you for taking the time to come and join me on the podcast, Charlie. It's a pleasure. Lovely to be here. Yeah, it's lovely. It's lovely to see you and to have this opportunity (laughs) to interview you. And it's in some ways easier to interview you than some of my other guests because you are a good friend of mine and I know you quite well and that is also quite challenging as well because I'm potentially going to struggle to keep it professional (laughs) as we get into a conversation so um, I will do my best to be a professional and respectable host as I answer these questions ask these questions but at the same time really looking forward to just having this conversation with you. Yeah, me too. So I wondered if you could start off by explaining to me and also the listeners the work that you do in sustainable horticulture and what that entails. So um, RHS Bridgewater is a sustainable site generally. Um, So sustainable horticulture is all about, you know, um, not doing any harm. Um, working in a more organic way. Um, so, for example, it used to be common practice to do single digging or even double digging, which is literally um, every year going through all of the beds, um, digging down one meter and turning the soil over because it was a felt it, it improved the soil. Um, but what your as well as but, you know, potentially loosening up any compacted soil and bringing nutrients to the surface, which it does do, um, you're destroying all the mycorrhizal um, organisms that are in the soil. And that's what also, what, that's what naturally brings nutrients to the surface um, and, and just generally creates a net, network of, of goodness in the soil. Um, so it's a bad thing to be doing and it's not done at Bridgewater um, to improve the soil what we do is if it's for edibles we might add manure um, over winter so it's got time to break down before we actually use those beds again um, or a fine composted bark everywhere else um, and this year as well um, I was part of the woodland team when they did a bit of an experiment with a chop and drop bed so basically everything in that bed that's a herbaceous perennial they're plants that um you cut back every year so like grasses you know ornamental grasses and all sorts of different things that flower and things like that so you've got to cut them back every year and they grow again from ground level or underground in some cases um so when we came to chop chopping all that back, we just dropped it on the bed and left that as a mulch to see what would happen and if that makes any difference to that bed. Is it better for it? Um, you know, it's it's certainly environmentally friendly. Um, but one of the things that a mulch does as well is suppress weeds. Um, all well. All weeds are wild, wildflowers to me, but some of them are thugs and you, you've got to keep on top of the thugs so that you, they don't take over the bed. I think that applies to um, life as well, probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
so yeah there's all sorts of things and and it's not just you know sustainable horticulture that um is important at Bridgewater and to Bridgewater staff and management. It's sustainability. It is a is a whole, um, and you know, in in improving conditions for wildlife. So we have team days, uh, curatorial team days. Uh, that's the gardening team curatorial, um, about once a month. And generally speaking, it's we'll all get together and do a big job that a team would struggle to do on their own. So one of the days we were planting daffodil bulbs, and I think there was about 10,000 bulbs or something ridiculous that we <laughs> needed to do. Um, but one of the things we did over the winter was we all built a bird box, and now they're all up in the garden. Um, so, you know, things for wildlife as well as things for plants. Um, and you know, in the welcome building, there's no plastic bags in the shop. You know, so there's there's all sorts of, of things like that. I hope that gives you some idea. Yeah, it it gives me a a lot more insight into what you do than I realised before. And I wonder what the benefits of sustainable horticulture are, and why it's so important. So the more you use sustainable horticulture, the better your relationship is with the environment and the land and the more wildlife you're encouraging back in um, and the more pollinators, you know, it's better for all the bees, butterflies, everything else that's a pollinator. Um, so it's really good in terms of, climate change it's really good for the environment to garden sustainably um and of course it's not just something that we do at um bridgewater the rhs encourages anybody to garden more sustainably um you know to use peat free compost because um the use of peat in compost is um it's really well, digging up peat is really bad for the environment. It releases more carbon dioxide um, than almost anything else. So it's it's terrible. It's terrible. Um, so the, the the irony that we've been digging up peat to use in compost to work the land for you know decades. It's yeah. Um, so we. One of the things that is going on at RHS Wisley down near London is there is um, various scientists there are working on new peat-free media, they call it, peat-free compost, um, for all sorts of different plants um, to make sure that we do have really good peat-free alternatives. Because there's, there's good ones available already. Um, some of them we use in the garden. We also make our own compost. Um, but there's certain plants, uh, ericaceous plants have always been a bit tricky. So they're the ones that need more acidic soil. So they've always been a bit more tricky um, in the peat-free compost that is sort of currently available. Um, so I saw there was a news story that popped up on my in my RX my RHS, which is our, you know, online newsletter and everything, um, that the trial that they'd done with carnivorous plants recently, which need ericaceous soil, um, the peat-free, the ones growing in peat-free did better than the ones growing in peat. Right, okay. So it looks like they're cracking that nut, which is great. Um, Yeah, I could. There's so many different ways I could answer that question. So I'm going to let you ask another one. <laughs> yeah, I was just interested to know why gardeners used peat in the first place. What was the purpose of using peat in compost? What does it What does it do for the plants? What are the benefits of it? It makes um, it's very good free draining um, soil basically uh, um so plants which plants like because it holds enough moisture 
um, for the plant to be happy, but it lets it drain out so it doesn't get soggy. Um, and then, you know, the, the plant roots will die. If it's so you've got to find something um that works as well. But bearing in mind that peat's only really been used on a, an industrial scale since World War Two. Um so for the centuries before that, we were growing just fine not using peat. Um and then, you know, like I say, it became um uh, it was sort of not dis not discovered, but it was used more and more became big business mm -hmm. um, and, you know, because it's convenient and it was a while before people realised the damage mm. that was being done. Um, although, to, to be fair, most peat bogs are exceptional for wildlife, so you've got to think that they must have known that what we were doing was killing off areas for wildlife every time they drained a peat bog and then extracted mm. the peat. Mm. But there you go. Um, yeah. So it, it sounds like the work that you're doing and the work that everybody at Bridgewater is doing is about getting back to a more ecological way of growing plants, a more conscious way of growing plants that is not going to be destructive to the environment. And I totally get where you're coming from when you say you know the irony of damaging the environment to create an environment it kind of doesn't make sense at all so I'm glad that there is research being done in how to make that process better for the environment and as you mentioned climate change is such an important topic to consider um I'm not as aware of what the issues are with climate change for myself personally I know it's incredibly important and it's something that I should research more but I wondered if I know it's not your speciality but what what do you know about climate change at the moment and where we're at with that as a civilization I guess um I think you know what's going on at the moment the wildfires wildfires all over the world you know tell its own story really you know it's it's greece algeria canada you know other areas of europe it, um you know and further south it's you know wildfires on this scale happen because there's been weeks of hot weather everything's dried out there's no moisture and all it takes is a spark and everything just goes up. Um, and, you know, generally speaking, wildfires aren't actually set deliberately. People sort of seem to think they are, but they're not. It's, you know, it's just, it just, ha you know, they can ignite because the land's so dry. And then, um, you know, the sun shines down on something and it sets a spark and, yeah. Um, so I think, you know, we need to speed up what we're doing to combat climate change. So not have it the, I think what the world leaders agreed at things like the, you know, the COP summits um, is not to let the world heat more than Preferably not more than one and a half degrees, but definitely not more than two. Um, and the aims seem to be generally, our UK aims, they're generally tied to 2030 and 2050. Um, but it's not fast enough. Mm -hmm. um, you know, lots of leaders seem to sort of comfortably, you know, because 2050 is just long enough away that it's then not their, it won't be their problem mm. to fulfil whatever it is that they're promising they'll do. Um, and it's not being worked towards. Um, so there was a news story about, for example, um, the UK is committed to banning the sale of petrol and diesel powered cars by 2030 
um, and 40 MPs last week um, submitted a petition to the government to ask for that to be pushed back to 2035. Mm. Now, I think Rishi Sunak said that they weren't going to do that, that we're committed to the 2030 date. And, you know, 40 MPs is a minority. But just the fact that that's still happening Mm. isn't good at all. You know, we need to, it's not, we need to, we don't need to push it back. We need to work out how realistically we're going to get there. Mm. Um, so I believe, I think that every new supermarket, uh, when it's been built, they have to have the electric charging points in the car parks. Right. Okay. Um, which is great. So there's much more infrastructure there. Um, but I don't, you know, I have no idea if there's a plan to have them at petrol stations or, and of course it takes a while to charge a car. So the people who manufacture cars are trying to speed that up. Um, but there's there's a lot of infrastructure problems there mm. that need to be thought about. Um, yeah, so... Yeah, climate change is a is such a huge thing, and the, you know all the sewage being released and all the that's doing so much damage to rivers and lakes, and so yeah, it's one of those where I think individually you you can make a difference um, with your own choices because people power choices make a difference. Um, you know that's how plastic bags got banned. That's how. Um, plastic cutlery got banned it wasn't that the industries that use those things decided that they shouldn't be using them it was that people started realizing that single-use plastic is a terrible can be terrible for the environment um, and made petitions and started making choices so it's you know we can make a difference but there's a lot of government stuff that needs to happen as well but then that and you know the difference there is who you vote in hmm. Absolutely. Um, yeah. I think it is important to highlight that there is personal choices that we can make as individuals and also wider societal change that needs to happen at a more organised level through government. And I think it's great that those conversations are happening, but I agree with you. It's it's frightening to think that those solutions that are going to help to secure our future are being pushed back and postponed and I think it is important that as individuals we look at doing whatever we can to try and make a difference in our own lives and the lives of people that we know and hopefully that will continue to spread and have more of an impact over time but yeah it's um it's an interesting subject to explore and I'm not a specialist I know you're not a specialist in climate change but I think it is in some ways related to the work that you're doing and the fact that you've got this interest in sustainable horticulture suggests to me that you have an insight into the wider impact of the work that you're doing and the potential for the positive impact that it can have on the environment and I'm interested to know what your personal interest is in sustainable horticulture and gardening What is it that initially attracted you to wanting to work with plants and to be a gardener and to pursue this as a career for yourself? So I never, I never really knew what I wanted to do. Um, You know, so I got my degree in English literature because it's a very broad subject um, and kind of allowed me to potentially go in lots of different directions. And then I went backpacking. Um, And when I came home, I still didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, So I just sort of applied for jobs that I was qualified for and I managed to get the job at in marketing at Shipley College, which was lovely. You know, I really enjoyed working there. I enjoyed, um, you know, going to the events and talking to teenagers about vocational qualifications. You know, it's not all about being academic. Not everybody is. Not everybody learns that way. 
Um, and, you know, getting to write, doing the prospectuses. Yeah, you know, this is all part of a team, um, but you, you can put your own stamp on things um, and work with the designers, you know. So it's very, like, quite creative and you work with the tutors and the management um, and just, you know, being at a college with all the sort of different mix of people was great. Um, but, it, you know, I knew it wasn't what I wanted to do forever. Um, and luckily, college um, do a wellbeing day every year where different departments um, and different people actually will offer little taster things. And horticulture always did a taster session. So I think I did a hanging basket one year and something else another year. Um, and I began to think perhaps that maybe that's what I wanted to do. Um, I moved into a house that where I could look after the garden for the first time since I'd come home, or that there was a garden to look after. Um, I mean, there wasn't much. There was, I think, two beds in the <laughs> tiny, narrow things, but it was, you know, some space. Um, and, yeah, I really enjoyed working in the earth, working with the plants. It felt really healthy, being outside, um, growing something and, you know, seeing what you've achieved, it's really visible. You know, some things take two, three years, but you can still look at it and think, I did that, which is, you know, lovely. Um, so, yeah, I got more into it, did a short course, um, and then eventually made the decision to leave college and go back as a student. So that's what I did. <laughs> uh, and I did my BTEC Level 3 in horticulture. And set up as self-employed. And it is so much healthier, like the mental health side of things. Because I had suffered from depression. Um, and yeah, it's it's so good to be working outdoors. Um, yeah, grow, growing things, growing your own, growing, you know, growing edibles, growing fruit and veg. And yeah, it's lovely. It's amazing that you found your interest just through a series of events. And I think it's important to recognize that it's okay to not know what you want to do, but there is a way that we can just follow those breadcrumbs of interest and eventually end up finding a career or a purpose that we really enjoy and really want to engage in. So it's good to hear that that was your process. And I also think it's important to recognise that you're absolutely right about education and that some people have a better time in academia and other people have a better time in vocational subjects. And it's about finding what works for you as an individual. I don't think there's any one fixed way that we can learn or have to learn about anything and it's lovely that you highlighted that. I just wanted to second that point because I completely agree with you on that. Um, and also feel really happy that you found something that you feel passionate about and something that you feel has helped you in a positive way in relation to your mental health as well. Because I think that's important, having a purpose or something to do that you feel is wholesome and grounding and rewarding and gives you that sense of being able to feel healthy within yourself and that you're doing something positive and healthy as well. And I know, you know, over the years, you and I have had a lot of conversations about mental health and our own experiences of mental health as well. And I know that we've each found, um, I guess, understanding and um, awareness of how our mental health affects us through learning about the three principles of mind, thought and consciousness. And I know that we've both read The Enlightened Gardener. Um, have you read The Missing Link yet? No. Okay, I'm going to learn you that book then because it's a really good one as well. Sounds great. But I wondered if you would, you would be open to sharing whatever you feel comfortable to, your 
journey of mental health and how I guess how you within yourself have overcome some of those mental health challenges in your life yeah um so after uh, while I was doing my horticulture course um I was working at gin festival um and my last couple of years at college had been a bit uh difficult at times because I was suffering with my mental health um and obviously that you know that can cause problems in your work relations because you, you get you know you can be distracted you're not working at your best and you know then that can cause you problems it's just such a downward spiral um so even though I was doing what I wanted to be doing and I really enjoyed working at Gin Festival, I really liked the people there. I'm still in contact with the people. Um, I was at my worst mental health-wise than I'd been for a very long time. Um, you know, if, if I hadn't had my wife Lucy supporting me, I don't know what I'd have done. So I came across and I think it was through you, a Facebook group that um you were in actually and uh, that how I came across the three Ps. What I think. Um and just started to learn about them um and read more about it and I took place in an online group. Um and it just made all the difference, really, as I started to understand that um, I can't control the events around me, but I can control my response to it. And not only can I control it, it's my responsibility. Nobody else's. Um, and once I really started to learn that and think about it it just made everything else so much easier I've really calmed down actually as a person things that used to make me really angry um didn't anymore because I realized that it it was a disproportionate response more often than not um you know it wasn't the world was against me <laughs> um and I, yeah, I definitely found, and it it certainly helps as well. You know, I realised that um, my first route into the three Ps was stories. The first thing that sunk in and made sense to me was that we all tell ourselves stories all the time. And one of mine, really loud ones, was from the moment I got up, I'd say, it's too early, I can't get up, I can't do this, I can't cope with the day because I haven't had enough sleep. Over and over and over and over from the moment I got up, um, you know, and all the way to work. And at the time, I used to walk a mile to get a train, uh, at like a 20-minute train. So it was, you know, for the best part of an hour and a half from getting up to getting to work, I'd just be constantly telling myself that... Um, I was tired and I couldn't get up and I wasn't a morning person. Um, and when I realised that, because I was looking for stories that I was telling myself because I'd, I'd read something about it and I'd listened to something about it and I'd had a conversation about it. So then I started looking for stories and I just realised that that was one of mine one morning when I was doing it. And the relief. <laughs> yeah. Um, that you know, this is a story I am telling myself. And if you catch yourself doing it, you can say to that little voice in your head, your head shut up. <laughs> um, and I, you know, I think I probably started sleeping a bit better after that as well. Because I was, you know, I'd go to bed and I'd be thinking, God, I've got to get to sleep because I've got to get the right amount of sleep because I really struggle to get up in the mornings. And yeah, and then you preventing yourself going to sleep um 
but yeah, it was definitely. It, I think it really helped that I'd just done cognitive behavioural therapy just before I came across the three Ps because there's a few things in CBT that are also talked about in the three Ps. Um, so I think it helped me understand it more speedily than I might have done otherwise or see myself, see you know, see myself in certain examples or things because I was already open to that I'd already just been to therapy I think that counselling CBT can really open that door of exploring your inner world and the mind and when you have those insights from either the three principles or even if a person was interested in faith and they find insights in faith-based literature and that kind of thing having that openness within yourself to actually look at what's happening within your mind can be definitely a doorway to seeing more and um, what a wonderful insight that you had to realize that you were in a situation where you were telling yourself stories and that was affecting how you felt and how you performed throughout the day it's such a wonderful insight to realize that and I can totally relate to the relief of seeing an inner process and in a mental process in action and actually having a sense of detachment from it and being able to just observe it and witness it and going oh my god I can't believe that this has been ruling my life for so long and I never realized I know for myself with my mental health journey I had absolutely no detachment from my inner thoughts and feelings. It was like I was just completely attached to whatever they were telling me or however I felt with them. And I was just moved around all the time, you know, battered about by thoughts and emotions constantly with absolutely no insight or awareness that that's what was happening. And I wondered why I was a human wrecking ball in my own life. And I didn't realize how I was creating all of my own problems through that lack of awareness of what was going on within my own mind. Um, I completely projected everything onto everyone and everything outside of me. You know, anything that was happening within myself, it was always attached to something that was going on outside. And yeah, just the absolute relief of realizing what's going on and just being like how am I not aware that this is just inside of my own head um and when that clarity comes just how wonderful it is so it's lovely that you've had that experience and experienced that sense of being able to recognize your own inner thoughts and feelings and how that affects you throughout your day as well and it sounds like Having had that insight, there's been an improvement in how you think and feel now. Would you say that that's true? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, like I say, I I just became a more chilled out person. Um, at the start, it was such a profound change that, you know, Lucy used to just laugh at me. You know, things that used to make me completely rageful, just didn't even bat an eyelid at it, kind of thing. Um, and she was just like, who are you and what have you done with my girlfriend? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's it really helped me just massively improve my mental health and my relationships. And yeah, you know, and obviously... I'm not perfect and um, nothing is and I'm still working on that and you know I still have a slightly unhealthy relationship to food sometimes and you know that kind of thing and um, that's all related to you know if if I'm sort of struggling um, with a particular it's like like for example um, my placement uh, my work Professional work placement in sustainable horticulture finishes in five weeks. Um, 
And I've been a bit nervous about the fact that I don't have a job lined up yet. But at the same time, we're going on our delayed honeymoon for three weeks. Yay! Um, a couple of weeks after I finish. So it wouldn't be the end of the world if I didn't get a job until after that. Tight financially, but, you know. Um, but there's obviously a part of me that's panicking slightly about that even though I don't need to. So it's sort of making sure that I'm aware of that um, because I've definitely, for the past sort of two, three weeks, been eating a whole load of snacks after tea. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's just anxiety. Um, you know, I'm just, uh, as Lucy would say, I was, I am eating my feelings. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, now I'm sort of aware of what that is and where it's coming from. Not that you need to know, but it helps uh, sometimes. Then hopefully I'll be able to just go back to eating a normal amount. Yeah. I hear you on that one. Um, I've had an unhealthy relationship with food a lot throughout my life as well and have a tendency to want to eat my feelings and I think it's important to pick up on what you said about it being an ongoing journey as well like it's not that you have one insight into how your inner world works and you're all of a sudden this beam of light like your body dissolves and you just become this light being <laughs> you know like it's like how I experience it is each insight that I have into how my mind works and the processes that happen in within me and how I have the potential to in a way detach from that and not react to that and have more of a freedom and a space to choose a response um it just makes life a little bit easier and it's it's a gradual for me anyway it's like a gradual recognition of more and more space within my mind like the space within my mind expands with each insight that I have and it's not that everything in my life becomes perfect or I become a perfect person it's just that some things in life feel a little easier and less stressful and less worthy of having panic attacks and terror about you know I have just a little bit more freedom and space to make a choice that's going to be supportive of who I am and who I would like to be in the future and how I would like my life to be in the future and I recognize the potential that I have to make those choices that are in support of the best possible self I can be and the best possible life I can have. And over time, that's gotten easier and easier. And my life has got better and better because of that. But it's still an ongoing journey. I do not doubt that I'm going to continue to have life changing insights for the rest of my life. You know, I don't think there's ever going to be a point where I think I've cracked it, I've made it, there's nothing else to learn and there's nothing else to see. In fact, if anything, the deeper I go within myself, the more I find there is to see. There is just so much more space that opens up and there is so much more to see within that space. I think it gives us even more to explore the more insights that we have. Um, and I think that's just a wonderful process. And it's lovely that you're taking those steps and you're uncovering those insights for yourself and seeing the benefits of that as well in your own life. And I think snacks are great. Like, I wouldn't ever judge snacks or <laughs> comfort eating <laughs> at all. I think it's absolutely fine to do that. It's, it's one of the best things to, like, have a massive bag of crisps when you're feeling stressed out. It's lovely. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's all, it's all subjective, isn't it? It's not about there being a set way of being that everybody has to live their life that way it's about what you want to do and how you want to be and I guess recognizing the freedom and the choice that you have in moving towards being more of who you are inside um 
so I would love to explore more about what you think you can do in the future to continue on this path of sustainable horticulture and the career that you're developing for yourself. Um, and I also just want to recognise, actually, before moving on, that um, finding a new job is challenging. And, you know, I also think that sometimes there can be a misconception that if you have some form of spiritual insight or understanding that you never experience emotions or stressful moments or find circumstances stressful, I think it's... Um, it's natural that our bodies and, and minds respond to stress as human beings, you know, even if we can have some recognition or awareness of what's happening, it doesn't mean that those reactions stop happening. Um, we can just be more free within them. So I just kind of want to acknowledge that as well. But yeah, also with your placement coming to an end and you're looking at moving on to something different in the future, what is your path forward with this kind of work what is your ultimate aim or what would you want to achieve for yourself in terms of horticulture and sustainability so um I've applied for a countryside ranger job um and they for Leeds City Council um and that is all about looking after parks and green spaces. Um, so it's urban countryside for the most part. Um, but more importantly, I think almost in a way, working with the groups that are already doing that. Because there's lots of volunteer organisations. So you've got Leeds in Bloom um, and lots of other in Bloom um, organisations within Leeds in different council areas. Um, and you know other community groups schools um you know doing educational sessions and things like that so there'd be a lot of different aspects to that role um and i'm that's the kind of job that i'm looking at at the moment um i'm also very interested in growing your own food um because that's you know that's really sustainable um it completely reduces your carbon footprint because you're growing it at home. <laughs> um, and to that, you know, I, to that end, I did, we all have to do a project. Everybody who does a placement at the RHS, you have to do a project. Um, and I did mine on growing a meal in a pot. Um, so, for example, there's um, tomato, basil and garlic in one of the pots. So you've got tomato sauce right there. Um, or potatoes, spring onions, and chives in another one for potato salad. Um, and just to sort of, um, because it's easy for me as a horticulturalist to say anybody can, you know, grow their own and you can do it at home and you don't need a garden, you can do it in pots. I'm a horticulturalist, so I did it with a community group at work, um, because I wanted them to call me out if I ever did anything that they didn't know why I was doing something because then when I sort of write it up or because I've done an interpretation board at work you know one of the great big A0 bigger size a big A friend um, with the pots in the kitchen garden so that members of the public can see what we're doing and when I was doing things like that I wanted to make sure that um, the way I was describing it anybody really could go home and do it um so yeah i do love i do love edibles as well um but then if you know if i am in a future job doing sort of uh, educational talks then the examples i can choose to use could be you know things like food and obviously it'd be something that grew a bit faster um Lettuce and other leafy greens are quite good for that. But yeah, I'm definitely, those are the types of jobs I'm looking at at the moment. Um, because I think that the best way to spread knowledge um, about sustainable horticulture 
for me is to work in a job where you are working with lots of different groups of people. Um, you know, landowners as well. That's really important. Landowners and farmers and, you know, lots of different people. Um, there's some government legislation that is requiring landowners and farmers to have more um, uh, wild kind of hedges for wildlife, wild hedges around boundaries. Um, and there are job roles uh, of people who are just helping farmers get their heads around that and what to plant and what to do and how not to lose too much land to it, but because obviously, you know, they need to work the land as well. They need to make their living. Um, so, yeah, there's all sorts. I mean, I wouldn't be able to do that because I don't know enough about the legislation, but it's, although I could learn. So, um, but yeah, so there's there's all sorts of different pathways of kind of sustainability and sustainable horticulture. And, you know, I've learned a lot about, sustainability as a whole not just sustainable horticulture while they've been at Bridgewater um because you start to read about the subject and you start to do things and you you know I get to go to talks um all sorts of things while while I'm I'm there um and I've really sort of taken hold of the opportunity so I could eventually end up in a job that's sustainable you know as a whole um, focused, not just on horticulture. I, yeah, it's really exciting because it, I don't know at the moment. I mean, it, right now I really want to stay in horticulture, but yeah, it's exciting that there's lots of different jobs out there. Yeah, in that area, absolutely. I, you know, there's so much potential, isn't there? When you're just open to seeing what's available for you and have that confidence and ability to know that you can just take the next step that feels good just take the next step and I feel so excited by your meal in a pot idea I think that you absolutely need to develop that because it's so good and I also love that you acknowledge that I guess a lot of people myself included have lost the skills of how to work the land, how to grow our own food, you know, how to be sustainable in that way. Um, and so making it accessible for everyone in the community so that people can learn those skills and feel that satisfaction of growing their own food and also, you know, having a sustainable source of nutrition for themselves as well is so important. So I think that's absolutely something you need to get a trademark, patent on that, get that developed because it's such a good idea and I also <clears throat> from a selfish selfish perspective want you to get the country ranger job because if you're working for Leeds City Council we would be colleagues and I'd be able to chat to you on teams because um, <laughs> <laughs> I work for Leeds City Council as well so that would be amazing if you get that job I really hope that you do if it's something that you want I really hope that that comes through for you because that sounds like a really good opportunity as well and um yeah the meal in a pot idea I think is just fantastic and I really hope that you are able to access funding or support or whatever you need to get that idea off the ground because I think it's got the potential to really take off and I think that a lot of people would benefit from that knowledge and the skills that you can teach them in just yeah improving their own access to homegrown quality food um that's easy to cook with you know if if like you say if all the ingredients are together in one pot they can just harvest all of it and make a nice tomato sauce or potato salad I think that's a fantastic idea um so yeah I hope you find whatever you need to yeah and I think the thing is as well sorry go on. All I was going to say is I hope that you find what you need to to make that happen for the future because I think it's a great idea. <laughs> yeah. um, while I was doing my project, it's not com it's not a completely original idea, so there'll be no part of the But, yeah, people, generally, generally speaking, um, people talk about, 
growing from pot to plate, not specifically growing a meal in a pot. Um, and, and you do need big pots to do that as well. So, I mean, most people would actually have three pots together and rather than it all in one pot or, you know, you've got to acknowledge the financial side of it as well. You know, I did get to play with some very, very big pots at work. Um, and it's just also, it's things like, so to do a potato salad, you've got to sow your spring onion seeds quite late because you want them to be ready when your potatoes are ready to harvest, which if you, there's different types of potatoes. So there's, there's first earlies and firsts and seconds. The first earlies, I've just harvested mine at home and at work uh, last week or the week before. And obviously spring onions are called spring onions for a reason. Um, so I sowed those late so that they develop a bit later and be ready when the potatoes are. And I mean, you can, you, you can leave them in as well. You can just leave them in um, and they will just get bigger. Um, so my spring onions, um, the ones I sowed earlier and I have just left them growing, I, I looked at one of them today and it's enormous. It's, it's not that it's, 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 an onion. <laughs> it's not a spring onion. <laughs> um, it still tastes like a spring onion. It's still a different flavor. <laughs> um, but yes, so there's definitely things you need to know. And again, the other example I used of the tomato sauce, um, once you harvest garlic, you've got to let it sort of dry out so you don't actually use it immediately. So in a way, the garlic you're growing this year, you might use in your tomato sauce next year, mm -hmm. kind of. Um, but it's it's really easy to grow. Um, which, and I'm not sure I'd appreciated actually how easy it is to grow uh, before because I don't think I'd actually grown it before. I chose to do it for the project. Um, and I didn't choose all the food combinations. What I did was um, I made up a list of different things that you could realistically grow in a pot. And again, potatoes, you've got to choose a small variety. And it's all stuff like that. Um, so I made up a list of things that you can actually grow in a pot and things that might go together quite nicely. But it was a longer list than what I've actually grown. And I took it to the community group and I was like, what realistically do you want to eat? Um, so that and that was kind of really useful as well, because it's not about what I want to eat. It's about what a broader section, a broader contrast of people. So taking it to a group of people was really helpful because we whittled some out. Um, yeah, and that's so that's been. That's been really useful, really helpful. Um, but yeah, definitely, I've really enjoyed doing it. Um, and we've, we've, as just mentioned, we've grown everything in the that I did in the project at work. I grew at home this year as well. Amazing. Um, so yeah, I'm just we're just starting to harvest things, and it's really good because I'd forgot I haven't grown my own not not on this kind of scale before. Um, I've just had, I might have a tomato plant one year or a chilli or whatever, but I've never really kind of gone, right, let's grow loads of stuff. Um, and yeah, it's it's just been really good and the flavour's so much better. <laughs> I Yeah, I can imagine. And also from experience of having food that's just been freshly harvested, the flavour is a lot better than anything you can get that's been sat on a supermarket shelf for three four days and previous to that potentially in a truck for a day or two so yeah it's, it sounds amazing and I'm so glad that you're exploring that for yourself and also the potential that it's got to help other people to learn those and develop those skills um so I wondered if you would be open to sharing any insights or wisdom or knowledge that you've picked up either through the work that you're doing in sustainability or from your own personal experiences of overcoming mental health challenges that you think would be helpful for anyone who's listening to know? 
I think it's just um, for. I think for anybody's mental health, it's good to get outside. So not everybody can work outdoors. Not everybody wants to work outdoors. Um, and you know, many different physical, mental reasons might not be able to. Um, but it's good to get outdoors. It's really healthy. You know, there's been so much research done now. It's a well-known uh, fact. It's it's good to get outdoors, to feel the sun on your face. Even when it's not sunny, you know, it's still up there. You're still getting the vitamins that we need as humans from the sun. We are a plant. <laughs> We're an organism just like anything else. We need to go out in the sun and grow too. It's good for us. Um, so even when it's raining. <laughs> um, so I think definitely that's something that's really important to me um, and has been important in my health, mental health journey. Um, but it's really, it's definitely important for everybody to do. Um, and, you know, it doesn't have to be going outside to get exercise. Um, it's just going out, just sitting outside in your yard or your garden or whatever you have, balcony. Um, you know, that's all you need to do. So I think definitely that's really important. Um, and to maybe try and pick out a story that you're telling yourself. So just sort of allowing yourself that mental space to try and hear your own thoughts um, and pick out a story and just see if you can find one and then challenge it if necessary. Um, because I think that definitely is what really helped me. And I've told the the story I told you today um, about the wake up. I've told lots of different people that when they ask me what the three P's are, I say, well, I'm not very good at describing the three P's, but I can tell you this as an example of how it's worked for me in practice. Um, and, you know, people have to really identified with that. God, oh, God, I think I do that. Or, oh, you've just made me realise I do that with, with this. And, you know, and so I just think it can be really helpful for people to just try and identify a story that they're telling themselves. I think that's such valuable guidance and wisdom. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I absolutely agree with you. I think getting outside, having some sunshine or even in the rain and just feeling the wind against your skin can just remind us that we are here to have a natural and organic life and that that's what we're made for. And I think that's so important. And yeah, just being aware of the thoughts and feelings that we experience in the moment and how they can affect us and feeling more in control over the choices that we make in our lives and being more of the people that we know we are inside of our hearts. I think that's so wonderful. Thank you for sharing that wisdom and insight and also for being here and having this conversation with me and for being an incredible, amazing, valued, treasured friend of mine. Absolutely love you. And, um, so grateful you're a part of my life thank you so much for for taking this time to come and share your story with me and i hope that you'll come back on again in the future um hopefully when your meal in a pot uh, have taken off and <laughs> everyone in the country is planting <laughs> them Oh, I love you too, babe. Thank you. You are also a very treasured Thank friend you. and part of my life. Thank you, sweetheart. <laughs> well, I hope that you enjoy the rest of your evening and I'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Likewise. Lots of love. Take care. You too. <laughs>